Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the use of crowdsourcing for posting bail has long been scrutinized by courts as a way to disguise the true source of funds. Crowdsourcing for bail has been seen, at least to one scholar, as, quote, an easy way to legitimize money, which would have otherwise been rejected by the court due to its likely being the proceeds of criminal activity. That's because if uh, there is little or no relationship between the defendant and those supplying the money, the bail money provides no incentive to prevent the defendant from simply fleeing the jurisdiction. This is especially true if the money does not have to be paid back. But while crowdsourcing funds is generally illegal, the use of charitable bail funds remains legal in most states. Charitable bail funds generally flew under the radar until 2020 when the George Floyd riots caused revenues to balloon thanks to solicitations from celebrities and politicians, including then Senator Kamala Harris. What used to be small, community-based organizations that helped post bail for nonviolent misdemeanors has now grown into a multi-million dollar industry. For example, the Minnesota Freedom Fund saw revenues increase by 18,000% between 2019 and 2020. Similarly, the bail project saw its contributions triple in 2020 to nearly $42 million. These funds are nearly indistinguishable from crowdsourcing websites. There's no relationship to the defendant, the donations come with little to no scrutiny, and there's no guarantee that the money would have to be paid back. Perhaps more alarming, what was intended to help bail out low-level, nonviolent protesters has instead been used to release violent felony offenders back into the streets with little to no oversight. In 2021, for example, the Minnesota Freedom Fund which then Senator Harris actively promoted, released a domestic abuser back onto the street. Two weeks later, that man, George Howard, was charged with second degree murder for a road rage incident. Michael DeWitt of Louisville, Kentucky, was bailed out by a bail project in February of 2021 after being arrested on multiple charges. Two months later, he was arrested for murder. Sean Michael Tillman, three weeks after having his bail paid, by the Minnesota Freedom Fund, murdered a man at a light rail station in St. Paul and is now serving life sentence for that crime. Mr. Chairman, the list goes on and on. According to an investigation conducted by CNN in Hennepin County, Minnesota, the Minnesota Freedom Fund has bailed out at least 65 defendants who are awaiting trial on felony charges invol involving violence, physical threats, or sex crimes. Similarly, in Indiana, of the roughly 1,000 defendants released on bail supplied by the Bail Project between 2019 and 2021, 24% had previously been charged with a crime of violence, and 35% were accused of felony charges and had a previous charge of at least one crime of violence. And because these funds are crowdsourced, there's no incentive for the defendant to show up for their court date, and many of them don't. According again to CNN, nearly 42% of roughly 500 defendants bailed out by the Minnesota Freedom Fund later failed to appear at one or more court hearings between 2001 and 2022. Commercial bail companies, by comparison, had a failure to appear rate of only 22% during that same period of time. This is why many states have begun regulating the use of charitable bail funds. Georgia, for example, limits the amount of cash bonds a charitable bail fund can pay in a given year. Indiana prohibits the use of charitable bail funds from posting bail for violent and felony offenders. Unfortunately, state-by-state -state patchwork probably will not solve this problem. That's why we're introducing the Keep Violent Offenders Off the Streets Act. The bill makes a small but important change to our criminal code to define bail bonds as an insurance product thereby subjecting them to the same federal background check and regulatory requirement as those of non or for-profit bail agencies under the Federal Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1994. This change would also bring charitable bail funds under state insurance regulation, giving states the ability to better scrutinize the use of these funds. Let me be clear, this bill does not outlaw the use of charitable bail funds, nor does it regulate the posting of cash bail by family and friends of the, excuse, of the accused. 
This bill merely says if you are operating as a non-for-profit with the purpose of posting cash bail, you should be subject to the same regulation and oversight requirements as those operating as a for-profit entity. This will bring needed oversight to organizations that for years have gone unregulated while ensuring accountability of these funds by subjecting them to federal insurance fraud statutes if they misappropriate funds or misrepresent the use of these funds in any financial report. The bill is a step forward in reversing kind of the radical, what we know now are kind of left wing bail policies like those that were promoted in Minnesota. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 8205, and I yield the balance of my time. 